survey. Um, I'm not going to try and pretend I know anything about it, so I'll let Dave talk. I know I'm, I'm, I'm here more to find out more myself, so I'm looking very much forward to what he has to say. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, you know, about the site or, you know, about surveying, you know, we're, we're a smaller group here, so you guys can holler them out. But it's kind of neat, you know, St. Esteban, I actually got a call from uh, Brian. I did some talks down in Florida on LIDAR, and he happened to see one of them. And, you know, they were doing these sites, and they're super complex. So I got a call, and it was right before COVID hit. I plan on taking a trip down there. Of course, it hit, and so we had to postpone it. And then that was my first trip down was down there at uh, St. Esteban. And one of the big, you know, as you were looking at those, one of the big difficulties we have is these sites are so complex. You, know, you see that rock ball he talked about? And traditionally, you saw they had paper and they had their little tape measures and they had string lines. So they're measuring all that way, which is great. But they're so complex, and how do you really map that out accurately? And so what they did is they brought me in. What's really cool about this is we take a snapshot in time. And so this is, you know, kind of like our DeLorean. You know, we all saw that movie, you know, Back to the Future. So this is kind of our DeLorean. So what it does, it lets us go back in history. So we go out there, we scan something. And even like now, you know, if we scan this, you know, I scan this room. Now, for some reason, if it matters, you know, say we had a fire in here, we tried to recreate it, but now this flame is here. But it actually mattered that it was over there. Well, when I did that scan, I can reproduce exactly where it is. And so that's one of the things they wanted to be able to do. Go in there, map these out create this big 3D model. And so what scanning is, it's really kind of neat. You know, we've seen it, I don't know, I talked to somebody and they were saying, you, know, you see it on Discovery Channel where they're flying over the Amazon and they're finding these historic sites that you could never find. And it kind of looks like magic almost, you know, because you got this big 3D model. So I brought my prop here. So really all scanning is, it's a ping pong ball. And so we all remember back to, what was it, ninth grade math? where we talked about, you know, trig, we had angles and we had distances based on angle and distance. You could figure out that Cartesian coordinate in your X and Y. And then, so if we know, if we throw this ping pong ball, you know, and hits and bounces back up, we're going to assume it's an exact speed from the time it left my hand down and back. And so we know that exact speed. And so this has like a really highly accurate clock in there so we can time it. So if I throw it down and bounce it back and say it takes a second, which it isn't near that long, but it takes a second and I know that it goes you know, one meter per second, and it took one second, it came down and back, that means it's a half a meter away. So based on that, plus this also is doing the angle, so it knows exactly what direction it threw it out, which orientation this was, and based on all that data, then it can create an XYZ coordinate. Now imagine instead of one ping pong ball, so when I hit my start button here, I don't have to orientate it just because I turned it on, but it's gonna take 25 seconds to spin around in a circle. And so you'll see it has to start off the beginning here. So right now, what it's doing, it's shooting out 2 million ping pong balls a second. So if you imagine, you look at this room, and I actually tried to scan it. For some reason, when I was copying over, it corrupted because I was probably in a hurry. But you can see everything. You can see the crack. You know, So if we're looking at the crack here, I can tell exactly where that crack is. I can look at these floorboards. I can see the crack in those floorboards. So I can tell them actually how straight these lines were. And... So what we do on the archaeological sites, we go out there, I'll get there in the morning. On the first one that shows up, I go and I scan everything really quick. They work. And when they're digging, you know, we saw Indiana Jones. What are they doing? You know, they're digging out all this stuff. You know, they're looking for that big golden cross. What these guys are doing is they're excavating like a centimeter at a time. You know, this small little amount, they'll pick a one meter by one meter block, and they just sit in there just really slowly, and they're scraping it off. And which amazed me because they're finding little seeds. You know, like these little tiny seeds, or else they were finding um, insects that were mostly decayed, and it was only, you know, part of the shell was left. So they're doing it really slow. So they go through in the day, they do all that. At lunchtime, when they all take a break, I start working again. I go out and I rescan it, and then we can tell them exactly how much has changed. And what's really cool about it is, so we go out and we scan one day, and they're excavating. And so back in that one, they call it the sandal shaft. It was the one where Brian was saying he potentially found something that was 15,000 years old. So that site was almost three meters deep of material. It was way back in a cave. So all that dirt and everything was um, getting blown back in there and filled up. So we didn't even think anything was back there. They started excavating down, and all of a sudden, they started seeing this whole big chamber opening up. So what they had up on top maybe wasn't important then, now that we're down a meter, you know, it could have some significance. And so maybe they didn't map it as accurately as they should have. Well, with this, we can reproduce exactly where that feature was. You know, or if they have a feature, you know, if you would think a chair, 
if you would take this chair, throw it on the ground, and break it in a bunch of pieces, and then over years, it fills up with dirt, how do you recreate exactly where every piece of that broken chair was laying? Well, at the LIDAR, we have that exact location. And even if we don't think it's important today, we have all that data, we can go back in time and recover that. So in a nutshell, you know, that's kind of how this works. Um, you saw how quick it was, it's about 25 seconds. I could pick it up, move it. I've done about 15 different sites. San Esteban is one of the neatest ones because the historic um, importance of it. Uh, before I came, I called Brian just to see, because there's some things on there that we're not allowed to talk about yet. But uh, some of the things that are really cool, we have that feature, they're getting it dated, so we have some features that are showing 15,200 years from today back. And so what that would do, if we can show that it was human activity, you know, that's gonna be some of the first people in the Americas on that migration route, which is really, I don't know, it's kind of neat, you know, seeing them there. And then from there, as we come up, we found things like, uh, when I was there, they found a condor bone, which I thought, I don't know why I was amazed by it, but they were down, I think it was eight or 9,000 years old, they found a condor bone in a fire. So what that shows is 9,000 years ago, people were you know, hunting condors and they were processing, the, processing them and cooking them over fire, which I don't know. I just think that's kind of neat, you know, because we think the hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers, what they would do is you'd have like a handful of seeds. You walk, maybe you throw it down and you make a big loop or a spiral, you know, how do you do it? And you come back maybe in a year and either you have something growing there or you don't, you move on to the next site. And so what this is kind of showing is they were actually occupying for some time here, showing all those artifacts, the atlatls. You know, we have some of the, like, they rarely find full pieces of them, and we have almost a complete one, so it's one of the only ones ever found, which is really neat. So it's an active site still. Yeah, we were digging it. Actually, we're supposed to be going back down to it sometime this fall. Uh, there's some other things they want to test, kind of the carbon dating. And what was really neat is July 4th, I went back down there and we met the CBS crew. And so CBS uh, Sunday morning with Jane Pauley. So Martha, the one reporter was down there. So she's doing a piece on this. So within the next month on CBS Sunday morning, they'll be talking about San Esteban. I don't know if they're gonna disclose any of the cool things we found, but, but yeah, it's really neat. We've been in that one and that cave actually, we go back to one part and it's, I don't know, it's probably about like that tall. So we're crying over, crawling over rocks and there's like a six foot drop. That's a shaft about this wide, you drop down an it, it lowers down, it goes back maybe 50, 60 feet. And it keep, as we're going, it keeps narrowing down, down, you know, farther and further. So we went back in there and they found some evidence back in there. So that's what's really interesting is to see, you know, how long ago was that being occupied? You know, were people actually back there? We have a couple other sites. One other site that I did some LIDAR on they found like 30,000 year old sloth dung, which is kind of neat for me because being from Ohio, I'm like, you know, I didn't think there was sloth in North America. And so, you know, I'm like, well, you know, well, you know, are there sloth down there, you know? And he's like kind of laughed. He says, no, they extinct, you know, 20,000 years ago. But these were like cow sized sloth, you know, that were going back up in here and it was a birthing chamber, you know, say so back up in there where they felt safe. But yeah, we've done a lot of different ones out in uh, South Dakota. They lowered me down on a hole about 45 feet with this, where I was able to scan up top, and then I scanned kind of down in the hole, and the difficulty there was once you got down, traditionally, how do you know how to orientate yourself? You know, because compasses aren't really gonna work good down there. You know, there was some metal in the earth, you know, and it, you know, if anybody's used compass, if you get anything metal close, it just kind of pulls it around. So we were really struggling figuring out how to map that all out. So we scanned it above, they dropped me down at 45 feet, which it was really interesting because like part way down it got to the point where you could barely fit through so you had to turn your head one way and they kind of lower it you know they release a little bit and then you drop a little bit and so we got down in there and uh mapped that out and it was huge once you got in there it was about as big as this room and that was the only entrance so it was they called it like a deadfall where mammals would run across it small ones because the entrance was only about like that big they'd fall down there and they'd die and they were finding fox from like thirty thousand years ago and one of the big things on figuring this out, which mapping is important, is they're trying to figure out how, you know, we're going through this trend now where it seems to be getting warmer, you know, and so how are we gonna survive if things get really warm? So by them going back through here, they're seeing how, you know, animals survived in the different climates. You know, they can look at the cold climates and see how the animals were doing, you know, then the warm ones, and so it's really neat. I'm learning a lot, and uh, it's a lot of fun, so. Uh, are you familiar with Josh Gates? 
Yeah. Expedition, Expedition Unknown. Yeah, I keep saying that we need to get him down on some of these sites. Yeah. Um, I was just watching the other day. Um, he was getting you know, the episodes about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is this something you can use there? I mean, can, I mean, he gets down in these little tunnels, and I'm just like, you're crazy. I mean, <laughs> well, that's, can they use this to get this where he doesn't actually have to go down there? And so that's one of the things that we're kind of excited about with a lot of this is some of these sites, so the one site we go to, we're down in southwest uh, Texas, which I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Marfa. If you haven't, and you, if you like kind of the arts community, Marfa is like this really cool community that it was Donald Judd, who was a famous uh, minimalist artist, and people come from all over the world to see his things. And really, when I went down there, of course, I'm uncultured, I was told. You know, we showed up on this one site, and there's all these, what I thought were box culverts, these concrete things. They're like, oh, what do you think about this? I'm like, Oh, that's a construction site. And they're like, so uncultured. This is Donald Judd. He put these concrete structures to uh, show like light. But anyway, so it's in this arts community. So we, from there, you know, it's three hours from um, El Paso. And then from there, we drove two hours, unloaded a side by side, and then we go another two hours to the site. And then from the site, we climb up the side of a mountain, and you go back in this cave that, you know, most of it's crawling. So not many people will really have access to it. So with this, what we're doing now is we're building these 3D models and kind of meshing them, and then we could do walkthroughs, and our goal, if we can ever get the right funding, is to create almost like a video game where you have an avatar, and you can walk through these caves, and you might see like an arrowhead, and you go over and you click on it, and it pops them up and say, like that site, there were some things that were stolen out of there. There's actually, um, the New Yorker did an article, it's called, uh, if you go, what it's called now, Spirit Eye, the bodies within. There were three bodies that were looted out of here. And one of them ended up like, in somebody, it's in somebody's house, it's a baby, it's fully fleshed, it's about 2,000 years old, but if you look at it, you wouldn't think it's 2,000, you'd think it's, you know, within a year it passed away. Guy has it sitting on his coffee table, so you can only sit down on his couch. And so what Brian's trying to do is recover these bodies. And so, you know, that's another reason with this, is we can kind of map it out, and if, when people are stealing things, or looting, or you know whatever they want to call it, you know we're able to reproduce it. But that's a site that we could kind of go through there and say, you know, this is where we believe somebody may have been, or here's where the sloth was, and you know, so really that's exactly it. We're trying to create it to where people can go, you know, people can see these places that they can't normally get to. Like Rolf, he funds all these, and he's he's almost 80, so he really isn't going back into caves. Where with this data, then we can actually show him what it looks like, and he can kind of make his you know, educated hypothesis. <laughs> no. Yeah, can you, um, what can you penetrate with uh, you go through dust or dirt? Yeah, so it'll go through dust and dirt. It'll, well, as long as light can get through. So, you know, like this chair, it can't see through the chair, but, you know, like the cracks, or like that window up there, if there was something behind it, we could get in. Or even the crack in the door there, we might pick up a little bit of data through that door because there's just a slight crack. And that's how they do that LIDAR, the aerial LIDAR, where they're flying and they're shooting down, and that's in the Mayan ruins, how they're finding those. You look from up top and you're like, okay, I can't see any ground. But as long as a one beam of light, you know, one little you know, laser beam can penetrate through and hit the ground and get a return, that's all it needs. And that's how they're finding these, you know, as long as, as long as light can pass through it, as long as the dust cloud isn't too thick, we can pass through it. I scanned in the snow before, and it was snowing pretty good. We weren't sure how it was going to work out. We got back, and we looked at the data, and the data was messy. I mean, all you saw was snow. Well, there's some filters. We took the filters. We wiped all the snow out, and you could, I mean, it looked perfect without any snow. I mean, you couldn't see through snowpack on the ground, but the falling snow we could see through. So anything that light can penetrate, this can see it. Now, water, it can't do water because, you know, as we're spinning around here, everybody knows that they can still see, so that means the laser was a safe laser, it isn't one that blinds you. So the ones that can see through water, they're the harmful lasers, but we can't use those because, you know, it's just a spinning around, it's throwing out two million pulses. You know, it would just be too dangerous, and even the ones up above. You know, so we can't see through water, but anything else that light can penetrate, we can get. So some colors it'll have trouble with. Uh, as far as like glass, glass is a tough one because you know if you look in a house window and it's a different color, you know you just kind of get that reflection, right? You really don't see in. 
And so as long as you're pretty much straight on, we can get some returns. What we actually see sometimes is, say we do, um, like I just did a school. We have a school, and then all of a sudden you're seeing trees growing out of the middle of the school. It's because the light, some of the light hit that glass, reflected, pick up a tree, reflected back, and then came back, and it thought it was straight out. It didn't know it reflected. But, so you don't get great, you know, penetrations or something like that. And then if it's a mirror, mirrors are terrible because it has no idea it hit the mirror. You know, it just, it just thinks whatever you turn back was, you know, straight down. They do have some filtering, and what you can do is they have like a plain filtering where if you have that service, you know, you can create just a plain service and say anything that passed through this, erase. So they're getting better, and that was a big struggle with these. You know, these have been around, the first one we demoed was back in like 05. It took 45 minutes to do a complete scan, you know, now we're 25 seconds. And back then the problem was it wasn't collecting all the data. It's what do you do once you get like, you know, even me spinning around here, I did a handful of scans, I'll have, you know, 300 million or more points. And what do you do with all those points, you know? And that's the biggest challenge. How do you extract what you need? Because really, do you really need all the cracks, you know? So, you know, a lot of it's just figuring out, you know, even if you look at that top bar there, you see all them zip ties. I can tell you how many zip ties are on there. You see what width they are, but is it necessary? Do you care? You know, so that's where the software comes in. It's they're starting to get intelligent, especially with the AI. AI is exciting. You know, it can be doing a lot. So where are they storing all of this? Because that has to be a ton of information for you to sign up on site. Yeah. And you're going in several times a day. Yeah. So we and just have large servers. Place and going, oh wow, this is cool. What did you do six months ago? So they're keeping everything. Yeah. So what I do is we have a couple redundant. Because the last thing I want to do is go out and scan it and then lose the data. You know, because that would be terrible. So what we do is we have servers in our office. We back up to the cloud. We were using Glacier, Amazon Glacier, which is just a place that's like a deep storage where you store it and don't ever retrieve it kind of thing. And then we, you know, so I have it on my laptop. I carry a flash drive with me. I, you know, store it all kinds of places. You know, but then once we archive it, we have archive servers that we put it on. And who knows what we'll do in, you know, 10 years when those all fill up. But so how long have they been that so the one site and so San Esteban, it's really complex. They think, they've been on it, I think Brian just started on it back in 2019. So he's only been there for about four years. But there's been other people that have been kind of recreationally been excavating it. And the problem with that is those are, you know, before they were amateur archaeologists, now they're considered looters. Because I guess, and that's what I ask Brian all the time. I'm like, so what's the difference between a looter and an archaeologist? Because you both are digging. You both are taking something out of the ground. It says, well, the archaeologist's job is we're documenting it, we're having it out there for other people, and we're trying to recreate their history. And that's the biggest problem with the people down there is, you know, they were hunter-gatherers. They were roaming around, and they had these great societies. When the Spanish came in, one, you know, they brought disease, and you know, we've all heard that about how disease went rampant. You know, and then the other one was the people were either, you know, assimilated. You know, they either adopted to the Spanish culture or they were killed. And so there's this whole... You know, they don't know anything about these people, you know, from, you know, whenever they started getting wiped out behind that. You know, their stories, and so that's what Brian's trying to do is kind of recreate these people's past. You know, figure out what actually happened, and it, it was neat. The one body they found that was taken out and Brian recovered, he did DNA on it, and it just so happened somebody from the area was in his office when he got the results. And they started talking about it, and this guy, his name was Yoshi, he... Um, he knew what some of his DNA markers were, and they matched up with this person. So this is a direct descendant. He's, he thought he wasn't from there, but his grandparents always said they were, and he just thought they were just making it up. And now they're finding out. And so that's what's kind of neat. You know, this Yoshi, he never really knew who he was. He knew he was from here and been here a long time, and now he's realizing that he actually, his family occupied this area for, you know, at least 3,000 years. So, yeah, it's neat. I mean, I've, I've learned so much, and... And this, I mean, it's just so neat being able to, you know, we're peeling back kind of time. And that's what, you know, we look at it. It's almost like a time traveling device because we can snap today exactly what it is. And then in a year from now, we can travel back and see what that was. So. Are there any destination sites that you're still looking forward to being part of? Yeah, so um, uh, Carlsbad Caverns, 
down in New Mexico, or actually I was supposed to be on that one. They were going to have me come down and scan all that, so I'm kind of excited about doing it. And then we have a couple other. There's a few more sites down in Texas that we want to do. You know, some of the big ones, San Esteban. I've been fortunate being able to use some different equipment, but I get back to a spot and it was a pinch point. So the one time I got in, my head got stuck. And so that was kind of where I decided that I wasn't going to go any further. So I backed out, so I couldn't scan any further. So last time I was there, they allowed me to kind of dig a little divot, and I got a little bit further back, scanned some more. And um, so even on that side, I want to do a little bit more in there. And we actually have some here in Ohio. We have a site over near Steubenville that we're wanting to do. It's, they're thinking it might be the largest cave system in Ohio. So hopefully I'll get in that one. And so, and that's what's really neat. You know, we're able, you know, not only the archaeology, but back in the 20s in that site, there were some boys that were back, you know, kids, they find a cave system. And these guys, you got to figure 20s, not, you know, the 2020s. They were probably candles. They went way back in there and they found a chute. They climbed down the chute like 20 feet. And I guess they got scared because they saw these big, um, not lizards, but uh, salamanders down there. And so they all went out. So we have these, you know, like diaries of what these people saw these kids found. And now they think they were the hellbender salamander, which is an extinct or, you know, going extinct species here in Ohio. So what we're wanting to do, we got with some of the people that are in charge of that. And so they're wanting us to go and see if we can find this chute and see if maybe there's a population down there. So, so is this the only equipment you use with LIDAR? I know at one of the sites I, I met you at, you had a handheld piece of equipment you were demoing and it was some type of it, it was moving around. Yeah, so it was a geo, or it was a slam technology. So this is our second scanner like this. The first one, actually I just got this one last week, so it's brand new, so I'm still kind of learning it, and that's probably why I'm having some corruption. I haven't got to play with it much. But um, our other one had a camera on top. We were also able to use, and I think you've seen them on, was it, um, oh, what's the one up in, uh, Oh, the gold that they're looking for. Those two brothers are digging. Yukon. What's that? In the Yukon? Up in Canada, where they thought the Vikings were. Well, it's been going on for like six years that, I don't know why I can't think of it now. The money pit or the, uh, on one of the Discovery Channels, but that's where they're searching for this, a shaft that they think some pirates may have buried something. But they had one of these handheld ones. That's all it is, you carry this whole thing, you just walk around as you're walking. You know, it's shooting out the lasers, and it's called SLAM technology, which means it's kind of, there's like sensors inside that can kind of tell how you're moving, and it kind of builds your trajectory as you go. So you have the little handheld ones, and then, of course, you have these. They have some other ones. We've been really fortunate. I've been um, given, I think, six different scanners that I've been able to take to different cave systems and demo. And really, this one is probably my favorite one. The Regals are really good. I mean, it's, they're quick. The data is really good. You know, the handheld ones, they're fast, but the data isn't quite as good. Like this one, you know, we're eighth inch accuracy, accuracies. The slam products, you're like an inch thick, so you just kind of take and do an average, like maybe the middle with it. And that was the one that we had out there that day with you. It was, I can't remember, I think that was the Geo Slam. It had something that was spinning around like this, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But they all have their purpose. And what's great is we do that data fusion where we take data from this, we take data from those. We actually had one of the archaeologists took their iPhone, and if anybody has the iPhone, there's something called, um, it's one of the scan, there's a scan uh, app you can do, and you can actually take your iPhone, scan around something, it'll create LiDAR. It'll create like an LAS or a you know PLY, different types of files that you can put into like Mesh Labs or Cloud Compare, which are the free programs, and you can actually look at that device. So you could take this table, you could use your iPhone, do a 3D scan of it, bring it in, and they're not bad. I mean, I threw it on this data, and it was, I mean, it, you know, it was an inch, which really for an iPhone isn't too bad. You know, an iPhone's what, 1,500 bucks? This is 120,000, so a little difference. Anybody else have any questions? So a lot of the federal sites, so we're right on the border of Big Bend uh, National Park, and on those, they're not allowed to do any excavating in there. Now, I suppose you can get, you know, if you get permits through them, but they're not wanting anything. They're wanting those sites to kind of stay intact. So there's one limitation there. A lot of the sites that we work on are private property. 
So if they're private property, and like in Texas, you can own bodies, and that's what's kind of odd down there. So you can excavate, you can dig somebody up, and it was because of, they were talking about during some of the wars, people were buried there, and the family members could go back, dig up their bodies, and take them. And so they kind of opened that up, but what they didn't realize, it was opening up for people to go in and, you know, loot historic sites and take, you know, <laughs> ancient people out and have them sitting on their coffee table. There was, in the Shotgun Magazine back in like 88, in the back of it, there was an article and it was to sell a body, a fully flesh. It was, they said it was 70% fully flesh, so somebody had rotted away. But somebody was selling a body that they excavated out of a site. So a guy in California bought it. He had it in a terrarium as you walked in his house. So you walk in the front door, and there's a fully fleshed human, you know, kind of curled up laying there. And he was dealing in exotic animal pelts illegally. So they busted in the door, and they see this body there. And so they thought he had a, you know, killed somebody and threw him in there. But you know, there's some the, there's some crazy laws out there where you are allowed to bit, uh, you know dig them up. And so that's kind of what Brian his thing is. You know, it's all about the education, talking to people, trying to get them to understand that there are value. You know, just not to go out and just dig things up because when they dig it up, you're taking away somebody's history. You know, we all want our history. You know, as we go on, we want somebody to remember us. And by people looting these sites, they're kind of wiping out that person's history. So, and that's where this is great. You know, so we're trying to recover it. Yeah, exactly. And I do. I did bring that up, and I guess archaeologists really don't like it, <laughs> you know, because you know his was all you know the glory, you know, go out and yeah. you know. So and you know when you actually get down to it. So they when we were in the sandal shaft, that one they show with that fifteen thousand year old artifact. I asked Brian. I'm like, hey, so can I do some digging? You know, this looks fun. He's like, all right. And so he asked me, and I'm scraping. He's like, you're going too deep. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, and it's a lot harder. You know, it's really pretty boring. <laughs> you know, it's just, they spend all day just slowly scraping. And we were on a site, and there'll be another one that's going to be on CBS. And um, that one, I was watching them do this site, and what they were doing is, if anybody's seen them make arrowheads, you know, they sit there and they take and they knock, you know, flakes off. And so these little tiny flakes, and what they were doing is they were scraping the site, and as they were scraping the dirt off, they were finding these tiny little flakes. And they'd recover. they put each one down, they'd locate it, they bag it, you know, and then they pick up the next one, you know, so they can accurately put them back. And, and I'm just sitting there like, man, why does this matter? But, you know, for them, that's the way that they can recreate what happened there. You know, and so with this, you know, we're able to get that. Yeah. And I was going to do some, uh, you know, show you guys some of the data, but it didn't work out, so... I'm glad everybody was able to come. If you guys got any questions? You know, Devin, it was great working with Devin. You know, he's the one who put that together, and he really does a good job. I thought it was cool how he did it, and it was neat. I know when he had me on camera, I was working, he's like, hey, i got to ask you a question real quick, and I turn around, and he asked me that, and I'm like, uh, you know, he goes this way, comes back, and creates X, Y's. He's like, that's perfect. I'm like, all right. I didn't have my ping pong ball, you know. So... Thanks. Yep.